Boa noite, <risos> boa noite a todos, boa noite, boa noite, bem-vindos a mais uma emissão do Três Dedos de Conversa. Tenho aqui a gaita de lado, deixem-me lá ver se consigo endireitar a gaita. Já está um bocadinho mais direita, <risos> já está um bocadinho mais direita. Boa noite a todos, bem-vindos a mais uma emissão do Três Dedos de Conversa. Hoje com... Olá... Olá Diogo Gomes, olá Pedro Felício, boa noite Maria Bento, um grande beijinho para vocês. A novidade de hoje é que estamos em direto também no Mixcloud e no Twitch. Para além do Facebook, uh, do uh, Chrome e também da página do grupo Old School Portugal. Estamos também em direto no Twitch e também no Mixcloud. Deixem-me confirmar se esta informação que eu vos estou a dar é uma informação fidedigna, pois caso contrário estarei a mentir com os dentes todos, mas é verdade, estou em direto aqui, como podem ver, eu estou em direto no Mixcloud, cá está, estamos no Mixcloud e agora vou ver também se estou em direto no meu Twitch. Twitch, porque uh, o canal está em aberto e deixem-me lá ver, cá estou eu no Twitch também em direto, ao vivo e a cores para quem quiser ver. Obrigado pelo elogio, uh, Pedro Felício, tenho aqui uma ponta do cabelo assim desgrenhada, mas isso é outra coisa. Hoje o convidado é um uh, senhor da noite, é um senhor internacional, é um senhor da música, é um senhor do mundo. Eu não me vou esticar com muitas apresentações. A entrevista vai ser completamente conduzida em inglês. Quem estiver habilitado para uh, conseguir acompanhar uh, este inglês, muito bem. Caso contrário, vai ter que rever a entrevista, vai ter que rever esta conversa no YouTube uh, ou também aqui no Facebook com legendas para conseguir compreender aquilo que eu estou a dizer. Provavelmente eu terei, uh, darei alguns erros no meu próprio inglês. Uh, não será fácil uh, acompanhar o inglês do Alan, mas uh, eu vou tentar ao máximo uh, que me compreendam mas sobretudo que compreendam a conversa do Alan, porque, uh, meninos e meninas, garanto-vos que hoje se vai fazer magia aqui, porque este senhor com quem nós vamos estar, este senhor com quem eu vou estar à conversa, sim, porque é um senhor, 
é um senhor. Um, esteve inc incluído durante cerca de 10, 11 anos numa das maiores companhias de circo do mundo. E perguntam-me vocês, é pá, Chrome, mas como é que um uh, DJ uh, desta envergadura está inserido num circo? Não é? Vamos tentar descobrir. So, from now on, I'm going to speak only in English for our guest tonight can understand perfectly what I'm saying. So, this is this isn't just an honor because the great DJ that I have here tonight, who is the guest DJ of the old school group in Facebook of this week, is, ladies and gentlemen, Sean Connery. Uh, Sean Connery. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, oh, my mistake. My mistake. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> let's do this <laughs> let's do this from the beginning my guest tonight and above all the guest of the old school project the old school group of portugal mr alan vinit <laughs> big random applause yeah 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 <laughs> what an intro <laughs> what an entrance oh yeah what an entrance I used to do this with my old guests. I sp <laughs> so I, I have to be uh, uh, honest with you, uh, Alan. The first time yeah. I saw you, the first time I saw you, I saw Sean Connery. Don't ask me why. Don't ask me why. But the white beard is suspect about that. So, Alan, first of all many thanks for um accept this invitation from uh, ah, old school. my pleasure thanks for inviting me from old school portugal the the main the main complaints of this uh invitation was nuno baião yeah. uh, and i do I'm think real. he's a great friend of yours and is a great friend of uh, of ours here in portugal too of mm -hmm. uh, of the of this great group um Before I went into our conversation, did you know about old school Portugal? Well, Nuno is the one that really uh, introduced me to it, and I just went check quickly, and uh, it just happened two weeks ago. And so, when Nuno invite you, what did you think about it? Well, you know, uh, I went to check it out, and uh, he explained to me quickly. Uh, You know, it's like a, with the name Old School, uh, so it portrays a part of of, uh, of music. Like a, to me, it reflects more like the '90s. You know, where when uh, the guys like uh, DJ Vibe and uh, Nuno Kac and, uh, and guys like that started really uh, producing and getting stuff out there. You know, so I've always had the link with Portugal, also with my good friend Miguel Grassa which I, I put uh, in touch with you guys. That yes, night, uh, yes, 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 uh, Miguel Graça. Yeah. You, you, you talk about Nuno Cacho. It was the yeah. Nuno Cacho? Yeah. I've been with Nuno in uh, last Sunday. Oh, yeah, well, if, yes, when you see him, give him with, a I've big hug him. for me. Yeah, we've known each other for a long time. Yeah, I have to I have to spoke about, uh, about yeah, you with, with him. I met him also with uh, Angel, Angel Morris. Oh yeah, Angel, Angel Morris. Morris. Yeah, you got a story yeah, yeah. with that guy. You got a big yeah. story with that yeah, guy. Yeah. But first, first we got to begin yeah. where all begin. So okay. all begin somewhere in 1966. No, yeah, well that's when I'm I was born. <laughs> <laughs> not bad, not bad. So in 1966, so you born in Montreal, Canada, right? Yeah, a, a little bit southwest of Montreal, about uh, 45 minutes outside of Montreal. Yes. In the southwest, yeah. And you were, um, you can spoke us a little about your big name as small town boy with big dreams. Can you talk about this small town boy with big dreams? The, the small town boy refers to the song by uh, by Bronski Beat. Obviously, that that 
touched me when it came out in the early 80s when I was a small town boy, you know, and uh, uh, with big dreams. It's just that I always known that I, uh, I would work in music. This is something I, I caught on like at a very early age. Uh, always loved music. My mom, my grandma, my uncle were all musicians. Uh, so we would do stuff at, at the Christmas, we'd sing along, you know, and stuff like that. So I've, I've, I've been introduced to music very, very early on. On the age of five. So I can see here, um, Alan uh, sent me his biography and this is magic. I, I uh, wrote, the, uh, I read your uh, biography and sorry for my English. No, no uh, worries. My my Portuguese is a lot worse. <laughs> I, I read I read his biography, and I um, at a certain time I was reading magic, and you all are going to understand um, right in front of, of our conversation why I am telling this. So your mom and your grandmother, uh, Diane and Madeline, uh, yeah. were the master pianos of the family no, no, you know they were not masters but they played well you know they they, okay. they could uh, yeah my, yeah yeah so they taught me my grandma uh, she, they had a piano my mom had a piano at my grandmother's place and she's the one that started teaching me uh, the, the, to play you know so to to be able to enjoy practicing enough to be able to enjoy the produce of your labor so on that you know? time so on, on that time you were a young boy with five years old yeah I must and have you, been like you were you you were that kind of boy r rebel and playing at at the streets and doing that amazing things that <laughs> the young yeah, boys do on their age. Child. i was an only child so I spent a lot of time on my own. I, I had friends. I went out with friends and uh, played outside. But when I was uh, at my house, I would always listen to music. And I started buying music when I was like maybe 11 years old. Like started buying like a, a vinyl, 12 inch vinyls. And I started, there was a, a roller rink, a place to go roller skate, you know? Yeah. Yeah. In the days that were very popular, so there was one in my town, and I just ended up going there often and meeting the guys that played there, and and you know I was fascinated by it, so I asked them to to show me, and, and you can, that can place you remember, I played for three years. And you can, <laughs> can you remember what was your first vinyl that you bought? That I bought yeah well i i can remember the first three 12 inches i bought that i remember uh, it was rod stewart that i think i'm sexy scottish legend uh, yeah uh <laughs> like sean no <laughs> <laughs> um chic i want your love whoa yeah and uh the third one was instant replay with countdown on the other side by dan eichmann so this Those were the first three 12 inches i bought this ever. was this was on the early 70s because uh, uh, i bought like around 77 78 yeah okay but, but i started buying 45s you yeah know, yeah uh, you start uh, you started that. earlier because the first 45 i bought was actually santa esmeralda don't let me be misunderstood oh yeah <laughs> and later on i came across the 12 inch and i bought the 12 inch <laughs> so you were part. you were a boy with a big passion on disco oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. always i still love DJ. anything you know i, I even this summer, I, I did uh, something with more like disco. Uh, for a long time, I haven't touched disco, but uh, I had fun doing that, finding uh, new mixes, new edits. There's a lot of them out there. I love looking for music, and I, I never stopped looking. I always spend hours in a week 
and checking what's out there. You know, and so, I find music and I buy music. And this this was the first three twelve inches that you bought, yeah. but but yeah. was on the end of the seventies almost. But you yeah, so start yeah. as a DJ at the age of eleven. 12, yeah. Uh, just before I turned 12. That's and when what, I started the what roller your parents, What did your parents say about this? Ah, my mom, uh, she was all for it. My mom's always been behind me since the beginning. Through thick or thin, she's always been there. She was very, she's very proud of her boy. <laughs> <laughs> But she, she nourished that from the beginning. She's always been behind me. So she supported you from the oh, yeah. very first time that you came at home and said, "Mom, I don't, I don't want the piano thing. I just want some cookies to play." <laughs> no, it, it just, it just all went together. You know, music is music. Whatever the media, whatever how you you listen to it or you perform it, it's music. You know. What was the reaction of some people uh, watching uh, a, a, an early boy, a green boy, doing? My, they were all DJ. my age, you know. It was a roller rink, so it was all people that went to the same school as me or another school, but all my age and all that, and a little bit above. But still, uh, everybody had a passion for music. They love music, you know. And that roller rink there is a perfect place to learn, you know. And what kind of music did you play on the roller rink? Uh, disco, full on disco. You know, like uh, you're my number one DJ and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, bro. And the people enjoy that because that is uh, yeah, and, and a, a, to, to... It's a small town. You know, back then there was like maybe eight thousand people. Ah, yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Small town in, in that small town. You know, all, But all, at the all... same time. I was friends with guys that went to Montreal and went to clubs and came back with uh, uh, with music with 12 inches. Like one of my first mentors, Francois, Francois Basque, uh, uh, he used to go to this club at Limelight in Montreal, which was the place for underground disco. It was a gay bar, a gay, a gay disco. And uh, there was this DJ, Rabai Wimet, which we all worship here in Quebec uh, in general. Uh, he passed away this year, actually. Sad. Uh, and I became friends with him eventually. So my friend, uh, Francois, used to go there and bring back 12 inches. With really, really, I loved everything that came out of that, you know. Uh, so I, bought, I started buying a lot according to what Francois would, would uh, show me, you know. It, it, it was always great music so i started going to shop uh, in montreal also at different places and buying my own flavor of music i've always done that not buying so, only into the the general commercial stuff i always like to be the first one to, to push have, a record you know yes, yes, we all yes. get that a little I bit i perfectly understand that yeah i understand you know, i understand you, that you have perfectly. to do that to be competitive back then Nowadays, it's more doing marketing, but back then, you had to have your you own have to flavor. Be different. You have to be creative. Mm -hmm. Like on these times, like on these times, the, the, the thing yeah. didn't, didn't change uh, a lot. But uh, on that times, uh, making the difference was the difference. Yeah, totally. So, uh, Alan, when it was uh, um, your first time on a disco... The club? Yeah, in the club. May, the first, I could say club was more a bar, was about, uh, it would fit maybe 125 people. Okay? And it was on the basement of a beer garden. So it was a small bar. And yeah. I was, I was 15 years old. I was 15 the first time. And the law here is that you have to be 18 to go in those establishments. So I was 15 playing in a bar <laughs> for were, people were, 18 and, uh, and over. <laughs> you have you had an invisible shield with you. <laughs> mm. And you know what? 
until my 18th birthday, I never saw a, a police raid to check ideas. You know, they, they, they do that in bars to check the people if yes, everybody yes, has, yes, you know. Yes. But until I was 18, it never happened. And I played every weekend in, in, in bars. And, the, and I played the owners, in different places. And uh, yeah, yeah. And the owners don't have afraid of that. No, man. No, because I'm not. Con, con, you know, they wouldn't serve me alcohol. Well, you know, <laughs> officially. <laughs> but, you know, I was only there to play the music. So, you know, I'm part of the staff. They can't say anything, really. Oh, I'm right. not a client. Okay. I work for the place. Okay. Um, and if so. someone says uh, something, I am the son of the owner of the. the, the, the yeah, exactly. Something like that. They, or, worst case, they're going to yes. gonna bring me to jail the and the music stops, you know. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> in, the, in, in 1992, yeah. uh, everything changed in your life. Why? My, uh, okay. From uh, from seventy eight, like okay, the the roller rink was like seventy eight to maybe eighty one. Then the first bar, when I was fifteen, was eighty one. Also later on in eighty one, and then I went on to play for until nineteen ninety two. Uh, I played two of the major disco in the southwest, and in nineteen ninety two, happened um, my move to Montreal. As, as a DJ, my, the first time I played, actually on the October 22nd this year, it's been exactly 30 years since that first gig. Since that first gig. on, on a, It was a club called Metropolis, yes. which back then was the biggest club in Canada. And how it was that big change? Because you were a small town boy, like you said before, and um, yeah. you changed to a big city. Yeah, but uh, like I said, the music guided me, you know. I, I came to Montreal all the time to buy my music, and I was playing outside of Montreal. And then I started, you know, meeting other DJs and meeting other people and shopping elsewhere. And and uh, I, I had a couple of guys that I knew. That one, of, one of them was my uh, éclairagist, my uh, light guy, my light yeah. jockey. Yeah. In Valleyfield, and the big club I played for six years. I was there for six years with this guy. Well, this guy was there for maybe two, but he was working at Metropolis. And the head of sound at Metropolis was the guy that came to do service at the club I used to play in Valleyfield. So those two guys knew me and heard me play many times. So they talk about me to the management. Uh, of the club so the owner and one of the managers came to listen to me in, in uh, at the club where i used to play and they made me an offer and at the same time because the place i was playing i, I, I used to play four nights a week the same club four nights a week yeah four nights a week you have to be different playing different yeah yeah yeah, 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 night, yeah play rock and roll thursday whatever friday we did a classic night disco and all that and saturday i kept it for me to play the new shit you know and <coughs> it was what, like that what, like then and on that time what was for you the new shit right the new change is that uh, as i got in montreal there was a really already a really healthy warehouse party uh community okay like uh, uh clandestine parties underground parties underground clubs started popping out here and there starting in like 92 93 91 92 93 and maybe like uh, at the late 80s like 87 there was this club called business which was one of the first one that played kind of underground house and stuff like that so when i arrived to metropolis <clears throat> i did all kinds of stuff like uh, open uh, open format uh, playing hip-hop from hip-hop rock whatever i i had in my bag and then it happened something it is uh, at metropolis new ownership and new management uh, they started a night 
called Squeeze, which was going to be an underground house uh, event. Metropolis is huge. It's like 2,700 people. It's a big club. And uh, we started uh, doing that event. It was called Squeeze. And Squeeze um, brought in the top of Montreal underground DJs like Christian Plenvo, Mark Anthony, Luc Raymond, uh, a whole bunch of people, some people from Toronto, Matsi. Uh, uh, so we started getting DJs all, from all over. And I was the one resident DJ of that event. Of that the event, common yeah. denominator was always me. I was there for uh, from beginning to end. Every Saturday night, I played at that party. So I did that. We did that for maybe a year. So I got really introduced into the more underground sound of the city, and I got really interested more into that than to just playing commercial, uh, you know, regular club. What I had been doing for like the first fifteen years of my life. So that was a, a, a huge difference and a huge changing on your way of seeing oh, yeah. uh, music. Because then I, I really started forming a signature sound. You know, when people uh, start seeing my name, uh, there was a, you know, HDJ has his own sound. Even if sometimes they'll play the same song, they won't, they'll play them differently. Yeah. And not mix with the same songs at all or the same vibe or maybe you know the context the context might be yeah. a lot different you know so <clears throat> and i really had a always had a taste for the more underground flavor and to this day i still found finds some really cool disco that i never heard about back then but now i I find super cool stuff, uh, really, really weird sometimes, but in the flavor, you know, the flavor, the, the the texture is all there, but it's not a known, super known melody, but it's a really trippy song. You know? Yes, yes. I we love, got, that. Some, love that. And we got some producers uh, like Dr. Pecker and uh, Michael Gray who mm -hmm. are uh, supporting now and producing some great uh music some great disco uh it's picking up some of the greatest hits of the 70s and some samples of the the 70s early 70s and middle 70s and more oh, yeah. and making some good music again but uh, the 90s the 90s house music was all about that it was all about taking pieces of of classic underground disco stuff uh i know in montreal we used to have a lot of really good places to find used records okay find used disco yeah. records with cheap and all that and once the french and the british djs started coming here and they would go check out those places and they would find gold Go to do sampling, guys like uh, Daft Punk, like uh, yeah, and brought, and brought that to Europe, yeah, Basement and brought that to Europe on that time, yeah, yeah, you know. So, guys like that, they used to come and uh, come and uh, raid all those vinyl places, so it became really uh, well known Montreal for finding uh, really cool classic records. That you don't find in Europe necessarily. No, no, here, no, no, no. Especially all the American disco from New York here, everybody bought that. But after a while, they just let it go. You know, they just sold them uh, uh, the whole buy boxes to those places, those cheap places where you can go uh, find records, you know. But nowadays, with the vinyl coming back, uh, uh, people got you know uh, wise about it yeah oh <laughs> yeah so, yeah so on that time on that time on the underground on that uh dj event production called squeeze you uh uh kept well, the attention kept the attention of someone who became a well, great friend of yours yeah so so let's say after after squeeze ended i did uh, a couple of really cool bars uh 
uh, I did a couple of opening of new bars. I did a lot of that for a while. And I, I had, a, you know, so that's like 92. And eventually, like around the end of the 90s, uh, okay, uh, 98, we opened stereo. So let's say, okay, before we jump to that one, I know you, you're eager to get into that part, but there's a lot to the story in between, okay? So after a squeeze, like I said, we start, I started uh, doing like underground parties. I, meet, I met uh, my then studio partner, DJ Mark Anthony. Uh, he used to do a lot of uh, underground parties and, and, and he was more in the, the gay community and all that. So I, I got kind of uh, brought into that world as well. And in like 94, 95, 95, well, yeah, 95, they opened uh, the, the first after hours in Montreal called, called Playground. Okay. Playground was my partner's Saturday night residency. Okay. The playground was built for him. So he, he held that uh, every Saturday night and on special occasion. And since uh, Mark had played also with me at Squeeze often, and we were both big fans of Angel Morez back then. So Angel's first time in Montreal was at Playground on okay. a Sunday night, okay? And since Mark played there every Saturday, we were gonna do both of us. So he would, Mark would open, Angel would play in the middle and I would close, you know? So Angel comes and uh, comes and plays, and after he finished, I start playing, and he's like, he, he, he got a kick on me playing. He really enjoyed it, and after that, each time he came back to Montreal, if I was playing somewhere before his set, he would come and see me. He would come in, yeah. <coughs> so we became good friends. Excuse me, I'm going to take a, a little sip drink please <laughs> so we became really good friends we saw each other with the the gang from playground and all that we went to uh miami music conference uh in march you know uh the the wmc winter music conference in miami yeah it's, it's every uh every it's been there for 30 years so we met up there and some of us in Montreal uh, had an idea to do a new after hour club. And as we were talking with Angel, Angel had a dream of building uh, a sound system, a club sound system. So the rest is history, you know, we, that's in 96, I think. Yeah. We built, we, me and Angel at the, uh, the stereo was born. So then there was Mark also that was with us, and we were the, the three first three main residents of the club. Okay. And um, we opened in 98. So I was there till 2003. Okay. But during that time, in 1999, uh, actually two years before 1999, a friend of mine and one of the guys that was uh, involved in stereo, uh, he tells me, hey, man, you should come to uh, Guy La Liberté's uh, Formula One party and come and play and all that. But the two times, the, the first two years, I was already booked somewhere. So the third year, which is 1999, um, they booked me in March for an event that was in June. <laughs> so I started DJing for Gil Alberti's legendary Formula One parties. Uh, Formula One is the racing. Yes, you know, yes, yes, yes. It's really big in Montreal. So, it, it, you know, there's a, a ton of stars from everywhere that come for that event. So Guy would invite all his friends from out of town to come and, and do the party. But so, we need we need to say here who is Guy La Liberté. Guy La Liberté was the founder of Cirque du Soleil. Oh yeah, and that is the magical part. 
That's the magic part. Yeah. That is where the magical part begins. So when you <laughs> went to the the um, GI events, um, mm -hmm. F1 events, um, yeah. well after were... that, after that, you know, uh, after a, a couple of years, well, actually, uh, the year after that or the following. Uh, hold on, I'm just trying to <laughs> remember it in, in order. Um, <clears throat> I start. I started doing different parties, uh, different places, uh, opening of shows in Las Vegas, in uh, in Paris, in Rome, uh, in uh, Milan, uh, uh, in Brazil, stuff like that. You know, left and right. And Guy and I became really good friends to a point where I started traveling with him left and right, and uh, and uh, just. Being there so when, when you start when, when you start that friendship with Guy, uh, yeah. your name became out from Canada. Well, actually, when I would play outside, like uh, for the premieres and all that, they were not publicizing my name. I was just the magic. You were just the DJ, okay. I was just the magic for the the event. Whenever Guy was going. They knew they had to have me play because he's the boss. Because <laughs> he's the boss, he he is the man. Yeah. Period. So, from DJ of uh, Guy's parties to Cirque du Soleil was a blink of an eye. Bang! A couple of years, a couple of years. Uh, but I think Guy also, and like me, you know, the idea behind. Us becoming closer as friends just made me think that why not, you know? And the guy also, the guy that um, that was in charge of those parties, of, of putting together uh, all the enchantment around the evening. Let's say animation, numbers, uh, certain numbers, uh, uh, decor, uh, food, drinks. Uh, you know, the, the head of this department, Jean-Francois Bouchard, we became good friends because we saw each other in the events. But he was working at Cirque du Soleil and they were starting a, a special events department. Okay. So who says special event and shows? So you need music. Yes. Right. And just prior to that, um, I also did consulting on um, uh, a Cirque du Soleil music remix project that the guy that had my job uh, before I was there uh, put together. And I was just there as a friend of Guy's because I was often with him to give, a, you know, like, a, I don't know. A, a consulting opinion. Give, yeah, a consulting, you know, and helping Bruno, Bruno Guez, the guy. Um, you know, that's it. And uh, so there, there's a record label over there and all that. So Jean-Francois, he, he tells me about the special event uh, department and uh, that they would need somebody to put together the music and at the same time, maybe being the artistic part of the record label. So there was a couple of things that I, I uh, kind of enabled to, to put together a uh, because they had to form a position for me to come in because I, I did so much different things that they had to correlate with the rest, but without being attached to one thing, one department, you know? So, so you did, you know, Francois oh. offered me the, the job and said, okay, I was, I was already taking care of music project for them, but yes. as a consultant. So now they just decided to bring me in full time. That way I can help have a, a musical vision in, for in, the, the in entire three, five or four different ways. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, whatever question arrive on my uh, on my desk, well, I have to figure it out and give an answer. And that were that were eleven years with Circo Soleil. Yeah, from 2005 to 2016. <coughs> tell us. How was the experience to be a part of 
for me, the most a big project, one right. of the biggest project in the world. Um, the I would say the most important project in the world. Yeah, the most important thing for me during those 11 years was the amount of creative people in so many different category, you know, uh, being a director, uh, a stage uh, designer, uh, light show designer, sound designer, uh, uh, costume maker, uh, you know, you're surrounded by people with so much talent it's incredible that that's what i retain from my 11 years at Cirque du Soleil is from the artist that does the trick to the person that sews the costume to the musician that plays the music to you know a Cirque du Soleil show is so many different details it's mind-boggling and I've been uh, uh, introduced to this, and I, I I I swam in it without being a um, more more as a, a a facilitator, you know, to help whatever production was on on route. If there's a something that I can help with, okay, let's do it. Uh, come to the studio, we'll fix that. You need this, okay, no problem. Uh, the, the, uh, after one year there, Guy asked to bring me closer to the, the main shows. So when a new composer that never worked with Cirque du Soleil came in for a production, for a creation, um, I would be their main contact. And I would I would be close with them and helping them, uh, listening, pre-listening to material, giving them advice, uh, and then when we get to uh, let's say uh, listening session with Guy, so he, he can give his uh, his, his opinion uh, advice. But I was also the one that translated a little bit because I speak Guy. <laughs> I speak okay. his language. I understand. I spend time with him. I know what he means. It doesn't necessarily have the the classic way of expressing. So you need a translator to, that understands the feeling he's trying to convey to the the composer to the change composer, the yes. accordingly. You know. So that was part of my job. Um, we did shows at special events, sometime for one night, sometime for many nights, but like one hour show, I have to um, sometimes modify the music a little bit to fit because it's not always with the same number. You know? With the same so, number? Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah, adapt, adapt those uh, arrangements and uh, prepare a track that don't have, let's say, the vocal and the guitar if we send a vocalist and a guitarist on the show. So I had to make the proper mix stereo yes. so that they could just have, let's say, a CD player and just play it sometimes. Some some other time on bigger rig, then it was all in stems and like the normal Cirque du Soleil show, actually. I did one like that. The very last project I did, it was a concert, okay, a music concert, celebrating Cirque du Soleil's 30 years. So I had to go through 34 show, 34 shows in like 76 minutes. So if you calculate, it's about two minutes and 20 seconds per song. Okay, so <laughs> and that have to beat on every number. <laughs> uh, no, it was just a music show, and I had um, uh, eight musician band. Okay, a uh, house band. Um, I think it was 18 uh, strings, uh, eight, six or eight brass, uh, 20 uh, choir, chorus, um, 12 children choir, 
and I had <laughs> eight lead singers. Eight lead singers, and I, I, I uh, this this was my project. I, I I picked the music, I did the arrangement, I hired an, an orchestrator to write all the parts for the right choir, all, yeah, and, uh, the classic instrument, and all that. So I got help, but the project I oversaw that project, and we did a video captation actually of it. It, it played in Europe in uh, on Arte. You know Arte, the TV. Uh, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Played yes. There. That was yes. the last big, and it was the biggest one I did actually. So on that time, on that time, that eleven years that you've been on the Cirque du Soleil, um, yeah. it was um, like living a dream. Uh, living on or, or not, living on a cloud, on a cloud above. You're just on the cloud, and you and you surf from one event to uh, producing a record to helping a, a, a new composer uh, to producing music for events or if you don't have time hire producers give them the contract follow them give them the the artistic direction and they produce uh, you know stuff like that like everything that came that needed music i had to figure out <laughs> and on that time, on that 11 years, you didn't yeah. play on another clubs, only lived for Cirque du Soleil? I couldn't. I couldn't reserve date because I didn't have, you know, Cirque du Soleil. Sometime when I came in a crunch, it took me uh, 18 hours a day, seven days a week for a while when I'm in a crunch. So I cannot leave that. To go Behind. take a, a plane and go uh, DJ and uh, plus just before that, you know, I, I tasted uh, because I traveled. My, like for example, my first uh, uh, time in Ibiza was with Angel Morez in 1997, and so I experiment. You know, doing the uh, the flight, you go DJ and then, uh, okay, big price, but uh, you come back. You cannot have a serious life with that. <laughs> it's impossible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Same 18 goal. hours a day. It's really <laughs> tough to, yeah, yeah. So um, I did it. I, I don't particularly like the traveling around the globe. I love yeah. traveling, but I, I'd go for a month and do a couple of places around, okay, or a month or two, but not doing back and forth like that. You know, it's like, Or, you know, and, and in Montreal, I had been there for a while. It's time for other people to, you know, take the lead also. So, Cirque du Soleil happened at the right moment for me. Like, I was so, at the end, right after the end of my uh, tenure at Stereo for five years, from 98 to 2003. And the last night I played as a resident was opening for Toe. Bye. Did you vibe? Yeah. yeah, DJ Vibe, DJ Vibe. Yeah. That was uh, my last gig as a resident at Stereo from my first... I, I came back and played after, but uh, it was my last time as a resident was opening for for so Yeah, I was happy. And I, have to, and I have to believe that you and uh, Tal uh, have a great friendship from since then. Yeah, well, but you know, we don't speak that often, but it's been a while, but I know we would end up in the same room. It would be like a big hug and uh, hey, how have you yeah, been? And a big man? party I'll... too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and and since I, I uh, you know, I got a little bit uh, sidetrack from the the whole club DJ uh, all that one with 11 years at Cirque, right? So uh, it's hard to keep in touch with people when you don't even have time. When you don't to have time to talk with your yes. family. Yeah. Yes, yes, you yes, know? yes. Yeah, you took out the words of my mouth. <laughs> it's intense. I, a couple of friends so, of mine in, were. In, um, in 2016, uh, you yeah. decide to get out from Cirque du Soleil, no, or no, there was no. something that brought you out from Cirque du Soleil? What, what happened is uh, in 2015, Guy. He sold his share of Cirque du Soleil in September, I think, September 2015. 
uh, that summer I was actually in Ibiza uh, taking care. I was doing the music direction on the Heart Ibiza, the the restaurant yeah. club. I was the music director the the very first summer to start the project. You know. So uh, that summer, at the end of the summer, he sold Cirque, and I I kept on um, working at Cirque until there was no more for me to do, you know. So uh, in 2016, they decided to abolish my uh, my position. So they gave me, uh, you know, a certain uh, a goodbye package. And uh, when my when John, the guy that actually hired me in the beginning, uh, takes me in the office and he just announces me that I said, well, um, I, I shook his hand. I said, fuck, man, thank you. I'm, now I'm going to be able to go rest. And he was uh, he, he was almost, he was like crying. He, and he looks at me and he goes, look at this guy. I just told him I, I just fired him and he's happy about it. Said, oh, hey, yeah. Dude, I'm dude, going, you don't understand, I'm going to get man. my freedom back. <laughs> <laughs> I need a break, and now you, you're paying for my break. It's a good, it's a good news. I'll be back at some point, whatever you know. No hard feeling. Uh, I did. I, I had done enough. I did so many crazy projects. If you look through my uh, my portfolio, there, I'm sure you saw a whole bunch of different. Uh, yes, I saw. And yes, that's saw. like just the tip of the iceberg. There was a ton of other. I just kept the the biggest ones. So. From that moment on, you yeah. earn your freedom again, and I suppose you get back to DJing. Yeah, well, you know, uh, first I needed to take a, a break, which I'm still on. <laughs> so my, yeah, seriously, I'm still just, on that just, break just, from just 2006. Six years. <laughs> yeah, it's been six years since I held like a, a job. I I, uh, I got money when I got out of, of Cirque, obviously. So I'm digging into that a little bit. I'm not rich, but I pay my bills and I have my house. I have my studio. I have my vinyl. I have, I have my stuff, you know, and I don't stress too much, you know. So I got money coming and I do little contracts left and right. I'm waiting for the good one. You know, if a show a director comes to me and say, hey, man, would you like to? Yeah, of course. You know, I'm just waiting for the right, but I'm uh, I'm not sure in where and in what I want to direct my focus. But at the same time, I have a lot of time to do music research and finding music and you know and stuff like that. So that's what I do when I don't have uh, anything particular. I make a. Uh, Alan, uh, I kept the idea. I kept the idea that uh, sometimes you uh, help Cirque when they ask for. Is that right? Uh, well, not on, since not since 2016. But if it happens, it happens. I'm not close to ever working with them again, except not the same as. What I did back then, which wouldn't happen anyways. Not with the the, the 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 new. But my good friend is now in in charge, and and it changed the dynamic how it works, you know. So, uh, and it's a good friend of mine that's installed in in my old studio over there. So I told him if ever uh, you're looking for something or you uh, let me know, I'll come in and uh, I'll come spend the afternoon with you and uh, help you figure it out. Uh, no problem. So I'm keeping contact slowly but surely because it, it changed a lot. And during the pandemic, they had to fire everybody yeah, and all that. And uh, so now it's starting to get back on its feet. And But now I'm, it's cool to know that uh, my good friend, which I've worked with on many, many, many projects, uh, is there and heading uh, a different aspect, but still pretty much uh, is what I used to do. But at a different level, it's a rebuilding, let's just say. So now so he's are, in charge there. We are going to get back to um, yeah. stereo again. Uh, okay. just, just to know. 
uh, the, the stereo is it's a, a it's the anniversary of stereo in November. Oh yeah, yeah, the whole 98, 98, 26 what? years ago, 26. No, it would be 24, but 24, uh, it, 24 it, yeah. it, shut down, it shut down for one year, so they celebrate the 23rd. Oh, okay, this year. okay, okay, okay. But next so, year, it's gonna be 25 years since the opening. Let's get back, let's get back to stereo. Um, yeah. between 98 and 2003, uh, yeah. just to know if you had some crazy stories <laughs> to tell us. On that on that club on that uh, residency that you have with Angel Moraes and uh, uh, also well, other DJs that you uh, invite to to play there. Okay. I, I have a very good one because it's one I cherish. Okay, um, one year every year in Montreal there's this big uh, festival called Black and Blue, which is a big gay circuit party it's been going on for 30 years also but back then they would do the black and blue and then stereo would open uh, in the morning and keep going yeah yeah know? so and they book a uh, big dj so that year they booked junior vasquez <laughs> Another legend. <laughs> they booked Junior Vasquez. Uh, okay, so they tell me, yeah, okay, you start around 10 in the morning and he's probably going to go on around 1 or 2 or something like that. So I bring one crate of records and like two books of CDs. That's it. I'm going to play for hours. I'm not going to bring music for for... 12, you know. Junior showed up at 6.15 at the club. Okay? 6.15, 6.30. I've been playing since 10 in the morning with one, <laughs> one crate hours. of records and <laughs> two, two bags of CD. How did you do that? <laughs> I played B-sides. I do. It was experimental. Yeah. And you then see. at night I was starting to have to repeat what I played earlier, you know. So, and he showed up at six six thirty, but he didn't go on until eight oh, because man. he was enjoying himself. He, he was enjoying himself, and then he goes, "Dude, he comes oh, in, and now he was ready." I said, hey, "Here, take the control, my friend. They're warm." <laughs> so. The, <laughs> The following time that we do something like that and that Junior is booked to come back and play stereo, and the guys, they ask him, who would you like to play with? He goes, I want to play with Frenchie, meaning me. You were the Frenchie, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he specifically asked to play with me uh, for the next time that he played stereo because I opened... Uh, and he, I, I know he had a great time playing after me because he played for like uh, 14 hours. He played for 14 hours after I played 10 hours. Crazy boy. Crazy <laughs> and he boy. loved it. And the people were like really warm to, to his... Because me and my, my sound was a little bit deeper than Junior's, you know? I didn't go all the way, so... It left space for him to take it to another level, you know. It was like a recovery party, if you want. It became a recovery well, party part, the Monday night, you know. That part that you a party lasted 24 hours. A crate, a crate Total. of of vinyl and two books yeah. of CDs, and you have to play ten almost hours. ten hours. Ten hours. <laughs> oh man, you didn't tell anything yeah. to Junior on that time, huh? You didn't tell no, anything. Junior Junior. Oh, man. Come on, six. let's go. <laughs> Junior only showed up at six. He came and hung out in the booth and then a little bit, and then he left and he went to the dance floor. <laughs> <laughs> and he hung out a bit in the in the back room, chilling, you know, and all that. And when he got ready, he came back and he, he was looking at me and like his arm crossed like that, and he was shaking his head. And then he goes, "Okay, I'm gonna take it now." Yeah, hey, come on, man. 
<laughs> have fun. <laughs> so, Alan, before yeah. we go, we got we already have one hour conversation. <laughs> this, oh, passed, yeah. <laughs> this passed very fast. Um, before we go, uh, yeah. I have something here, more two or three things to ask you okay. um, that I think uh, that might be important to us to understand. Um, okay. For uh, you became uh, on Cirque du Soleil, you yeah. became a music producer too. And um, well, I, I started producing before Cirque du Soleil, but part of my job was producing was was on, on that <coughs> and yeah. you got here and you got here some um i am picking the second page of your experience okay. as a musical producer because i am watching here and and if you want to see this just visit the Alan Vinay uh, SoundCloud. Uh, I can tell the link if you wanted to. Yeah, no, actually. SoundCloud.com slash DJ slash Alan Vinay. And you can find there some of the precious remixes. No, actually, uh, they, they are out because I didn't renew my pro. Oh, okay. So uh, <laughs> I give you an example of this. I have here. And I have the, the the I am a lucky guy because um, I hear some of them oh, like, the like finally from Julie McKnight. And that was my dub. Them. I called it my dub. I just I, I just use uh, -na -na, -na -na -na, from the original the bass, but two bar. It's a two bar loop the whole thing. And you know and I that just modulate. I just modulate. The, the frequency so that <coughs> sometimes they just the bass sometimes the high end come back <coughs> and and I, 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 might, I might say I might say that you might know this but yeah. you know that uh, remix from finally of yours your yeah. dub is played by Danny Tanaglia yeah of course I gave him a long time ago Yes, I discovered that. I discovered that. Danny, Danny has a lot of my early stuff because we were good friends. Like in the 96 period, the playground and the early stereo period, uh, we used to play together or we used to hang out in Miami uh, uh, during playground. Rob Di Stefano was really good friend with the owner of playground in Montreal. So we all hung out together, you know, with Danny. Danny's first DJ gig in Montreal, I drove him around. I was the one driving him around. So that's oh, one. You were the roadie. I met him on his first time in Montreal. Yeah. We stayed friends. I spoke to him about uh, a year ago, maybe, with Alan T. You know Alan T? The yes. Yes. Well, yes. Alan is a good friend of mine. He actually sung song spoke <laughs> yeah. on, on a track that uh, i did with my on my pr uh, saint denis project saint denis is a, a a producer name for myself and my partner is uh, dj steve arias from montreal used to be my roommate back then and we used to live on the saint denis street so we decided to call it to call the band saint denis so alan alan he came to montreal one time and i uh, just uh I, I brought him in the studio, and uh, he goes, "What uh, what should this song be about?" I said, "Well, talk to me about your experience in Montreal. You know, back in the days of when you used to come and perform, and and you know, uh, stereo, gay pride, and and all that." So he just blasted out a, uh, about 18 minutes of gold, of pure gold, that I then edited and, and constructed a song that I called Once Upon a Time in Montreal. And it's Alan T talking about people from the scene from back then, uh, clubs, uh, just talking, you know, kind of like with the door, but he talks about Montreal. Do you still think, do you still <laughs> if, you, if you look at the post I did, um, of my latest gig, though, the Black and Blue this year, black and black, yes, on, yes, on, on old school on, Portugal, uh, yeah. Uh, on old school Portugal, the opening song is that song. This is my I have song. To listen I have to listen it carefully. So, yeah. so, 
do you do still you... think that the the how can I say this the last proposal will appear for you to be a resident DJ again? Uh, I have no clue, but I I don't. Um, well, actually, I did a little bit of that this summer. I had a residency this summer on the Sunday afternoon, not far from where I grew up, like across the, the lake from where I grew up. In yes. Warner, you know? And I did this all summer, every Sunday from 2 in the afternoon till 10 at night. And it's outside on a, on a little beach on a lake and with a sunset and everything. But I play uh, disco, new disco, remakes, covers, rock. Uh, early, early in the day, because it's the beach, I play a little bit of reggae, funk, uh, and I build it up, you know. And I've been doing that all summer, and it was really cool. And I'm probably going to do it again next summer. Uh, maybe one day I find an island somewhere where I can just uh, <laughs> earn money playing music uh, by the beach and have, you know, a little hacienda uh, not too far and uh, just chill, you know, and, and play music. Yeah, I'm I'm open for that too. Especially that Montreal in the winter is really cold. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, too much, right too much cold on Montreal. Yes. Well, you know, I've experienced it uh, for fifty-six years now, so maybe it's time to <laughs> go somewhere where it's warm. Oh yeah, you deserve that. Oh, you deserve yeah. that for how sure. How cold is it yet in Portugal? I, Did you go to Portugal? I've never been. I've been to Spain many times, never to Portugal. I've been to Brazil many times. Portugal. You have to come to Portugal. Yeah. Definitely. I will take care of that. <laughs> my, girl, my girlfriend said the exact same thing to me. You they have to come to, to Portugal, Portugal, yes. And the first thing you you, you, you got to do is when we shut this uh, broadcast down, you're going to Google and you will write Setubal Portugal just to see where is the paradise I live. What? what uh, you have to spell it for me. I will put on a chat for you to okay, search. Okay, okay, perfect. I'll go <laughs> click. I'll go click. Okay, more two things, Alan. Yeah. What is the music you keep playing on and on every DJ set you play? One song or a style? One song. Wow. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. Yeah. That's a tough one because uh, I have a couple of key, uh, you know, really old disco song that can pass in a house set or anywhere, you know, like, oh, uh, I don't know. Even today, well, so with the experience of the summer, I have to say T-Connection, do what you're going to do. Is that a good one enough? Yeah. I played that song. Uh, Marvelous. My thing, at my Sunday thing, I played that song. I think uh, I played eight Sundays, and I think I played Do, do What You Want to Do uh, five Nine Sundays. Sundays. Oh. Nine Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> and last week, last week, I did myself a re-edit of uh, Vertigo, Light My, uh, Relight My Fire by Dan Hartman. I love that song. completely finished. Yeah. I, I love that song. I love I that song. And um, I should tell this, uh, Relight My Fire maybe be the best instrumental track from the 70s. Yeah, definitely. Perfectly made on. Yeah. Well, Nothing I fucked say. with it. I fucked with it. <laughs> You're the crazy I, one. <laughs> I, re I reinserted Vertigo in in the and made a break in between the relight my fire part like in the break when she goes relight my fire i went back into vertigo but the full version with the strings as my intro is more uh pure more uh you know i don't yes. do yes. the full vertigo in the beginning i i build it really really 
I'll send it to you. Oh, I'll send it to you. Please. You're gonna freak. Purists are gonna Please. wanna. Purists are gonna wanna cut my head because of what I did to that song. Don't but, do that because but um, it's amazing. I, uh, Vertigo or Relight My Fire are two. Yeah. Tracks. Vertigo was that the I intro. can't accept. I can accept they the that uh, they they go together already. The music for any production. Yeah, it's amazing. I, there I are things. Love this song. There are things that I can accept. Uh, they <coughs> uh, doing some mashups, like underground sound of Lisbon. So get up. The yeah. original is just the original. Please don't move a muscle on that. But well, relight my fire of vertigo. I did, I, I, I did a re edit of uh, oh no, it's not so get up. Oh no, I, okay, I get what you mean. No, it's uh, dance with, yeah, dance with me. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So get up. I did a re edit on the set that you, uh, you guys are gonna play Sunday. Oh, okay, on the radio show. On the old, yeah, school. I actually I think you I sent you uh, the photo, yes, right? a, a, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, on yeah, yeah, it's on yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Alan, yeah, a few words, a few words to the old school Portugal group. Well, you guys are really, really lovely and welcoming, and I, I got some comments from the community a little bit. I've been following, and I want to thank you very much, Portugal, for having me in your uh, uh, in your world, basically. Yes, in I'm old family. I've been there for a while. Uh, and I'm happy to share with you guys uh, and say hi to all my uh, Portuguese friends. Uh, it's funny because uh, uh, Paul Rudy, who was last week's featured DJ, is a good friend yes. of mine as well. So, yeah, and I met him he's through here my girlfriend. He's here he's my girlfriend chat. before I do her, uh, when, before I knew her. So uh, we became friends through my girlfriend. Oh. <laughs> <It's funny>. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, yeah, she Paul is here on the chat. City. Yes, he's here on the chat. So, yeah. Alan, it was a pleasure. Well, the pleasure was all my being here with you on this last hour. Anytime. Like I told you, this this is more a conversation than an interview. So, yeah, well, uh, I will keep I will keep in touch with you uh, because I think that we have good ideas to share on this future times. I'm open, my friend. After uh, uh, the welcome that you guys gave me, anytime, I'll be happy to do anything you need. That's good to hear. <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> so you can visit uh, Alan Vinet's page on Facebook. Just type Alan Vinet or on SoundCloud. And if you have uh, some more uh, stuff to, to show us, please let us know on uh, Old School Portugal uh, group. Okay, Alan? Yes. Thanks for having me. Many thanks for this uh, wonderful hour. Uh, I, we will keep in touch with Old School Portugal and on my page too, uh, okay. to spoke no uh, anytime. Okay? Yeah, anytime, my friend. Thank I, you, my friends. I see you in the next time. Okay? Obrigado. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Ficamos a conhecer desta forma uma das grandes lendas do Canadá, do outro lado do Atlântico. Mr. Alan Vinet ficou aqui bem patente a sua história de vida, onde 11 anos dela foram passados numa grande companhia, numa grande produção chamada Cirque do Soleil. Não sei se perceberam, mas um DJ... Não é só o homem que carrega no play. O DJ também é capaz de fazer parte de grandes produções e de ser um uh, consultor para as grandes produções, fazendo parte delas e, sobretudo, também fazendo parte da sua criatividade em conjunto com todos os artistas que estão envolvidos nos grandes projetos. Um, eu tinha aqui um recado para vos deixar... Uh, na, na, nesta, nesta emissão uh, como todos sabem um, 
uh, a minha situação uh, pessoal nos últimos tempos não tem sido fácil devido à situação da, da, da minha filha. Um, Esperam-se novos desafios uh, daqui para a frente e um, foi posto em cima da mesa a equação de deixar uh, um pouco de lado tanto o Três Dedos de Conversa como a minha rúbrica semanal na Res FM, que é o Monchiquices Radio Show. Como é do vosso conhecimento, um, e eu expressei isto uh, de, de uma forma aberta, honesta e transparente durante estes últimos dias nos grupos onde estou inserido com os moderadores deste grupo, uh, tal situação não vai acontecer. Eu vou manter ambas as uh, emissões. Decidi isso uh, durante o dia de hoje, porque hoje foi dia de haver mais uma, uma notícia não muito boa e as coisas têm que andar para a frente. E este é o meu escape, este é um dos meus escapes, a música é a minha vida. E estar aqui com vocês uh, durante uh, este, uh, este espaço de quarta-feira não é só para mim um alívio, não é só para mim um soltar de espírito, não é só para mim uh, estar em família. É ter a minha casa aberta para vos receber, para estar aqui e dar-vos um sorriso e ao mesmo tempo receber desse lado uh, todo o apoio que me têm dado e todas as palavras de carinho e, 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 e não só que, que me têm oferecido nestas últimas semanas, nestes últimos meses, nestes últimos dois anos. Por isso, meus caros amigos, uh, vou de peito cheio com aquilo que vocês me transmitiram durante as últimas, uh, os, os últimos dias. Vou de um, coração cheio uh, por ter vocês ao meu lado, mas sobretudo vou de consciência tranquila e limpa que não, vou, não vos vou deixar na mão, porque já temos aqui uma clientela fixa, pronta a estar aí deste lado no chat, a dar uma palavrinha, um abraço, o que seja. A todos vocês, uma ótima noite, o resto de uma ótima semana e na próxima quarta-feira cá nos veremos para mais uma emissão dos Três Dedos de Conversa. Beijinhos a quem é de beijinhos, abraços a quem é de abraços, boa noite e muito obrigado.